gotten quiet, so I guess that's a sign from the guy that we might want to get started. Um, thank you for being here for what, for me personally and for the university, is, is an extraordinarily special event honoring an extraordinarily special person. Um, you're going to hear more about Dr. Sugihara and my enthusiasm for what he meant to NDSU as a scientist, as a researcher, as a scholar, as an administrator. Um, but I think most people, when they start talking about Dr. Sugihara, refer to him, start with the person he was. And the warmth and enthusiasm and the good cheer and personality he brought to every environment. And that's going to be reflected in this building. I would absolutely encourage you to tour the building after we get done with this ribbon cutting because it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary in its functionality, but it's also extraordinary in its design. I want to recognize Zerberg Architects over here. Uh, there are elements that defy that it's a, a boring science building. Uh, you would expect it to be more of a sterile hospital environment. It's not. It has space for students, has space for faculty, gathering locations, and design elements that really do make it one of the most special buildings on the campus. I also want to thank Krauss Anderson for the incredible construction work that was done on time. Uh, the building obviously is cleaned up, ready to go, and it better be because we have classes starting at 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, and that's why we're kind of having to squeeze this in the, the first day of classes before classes actually get started. Uh, so it's, it's a less formal event than we would like. But that's kind of the exciting part. Is this building will instantly come into full 100% use. And like I say, please tour the building. You're going to be impressed and excited about what you see. And it's going to, the, the namesake of this building uh, is, again, very, very special to me. And we're so fortunate to have members of the family here as well uh, and who are going to help us uh, do the ribbon cutting. Um, the kids don't run with the scissors. <laughs> uh, but to tell you a little bit more about why we're gathered here today, I want to introduce our Dean of Science and Math, Kimberly Wallen. Kimberly. Thank you for your leadership on this campus and uh, for bringing this facility, uh, this beautiful building. And, um, so this building isn't just about the physical structure. It's about building knowledge and lifting up diverse groups of students and of faculty and preparing them for the complexities of the world. It's about constructing breakthrough research that will improve human health, the health of our environment, and the health of our society. As I already mentioned, the building is named after Dr. Sugihara. Uh, he was born in 1918 in Colorado. And during his 101 or 100 plus years of, of life, the STEM fields uh, and the adva uh, advancements were profound in STEM fields and in science. And I'm just going to kind of highlight a couple of, of them just to give you a sense of like what happened during the span of his life in the STEM fields. Vitamins B1, C, and D were discovered. The number of elements identified in the periodic table grew from 72 to 118. During his 20s, <clears throat> the Big Bang Theory of how the universe started Many, many years later, uh, the theory of punctuated equilibrium <laughs> was proposed that forever changed the way we think about species, speciation and their interaction with the environment. The citric acid uh, cycle, or the Krebs cycle, was proposed. The structure of DNA was identified. The Human Genome Project was launched and completed. The National Science Foundation was proposed and passed by Congress and by the President. The polio vaccine was developed and made uh, available to all. And since 1979, the U.S. has been free of polio. When he was 50 years of age, the U.S. landed on the moon. The computer keyboard was developed. Think about that, the computer keyboard was developed. 
as well as GPS units. It's something that we all walk around with. So, so a lot occurred during uh, his life. Um, and higher education has the Sugahara Hall now and moving forward. It is comprised of walls and floors and these beautiful windows. But what's more exciting to me is that soon it will be filled with curious minds of students, of faculty, um, and they're ready to learn the science of their predecessors, as well as learn from our faculty and discover and generate new knowledge with our faculty. It's really fascinating to think about. It's very, very exciting. It's really exciting to, for me to think about how students will learn and discover their own joy of science and where it fits into their lives. Education is a pathway to discovery and innovation, which is the basis for research. And that research is done to solve many of the world's challenges and problems. This state-of-the-art facility, and it is a state-of-the-art facility, will really provide the opportunity to all to see what is possible and what science can do to change and improve the world. The, the location of the building is central to campus. If you think about the physical campus, it's central to campus. It's also central to our students' education. Most, if not all, students will pass through these halls on their way to their, their science classes, to their labs, to meet with their peers, many of the common spaces for students, and also to work side by side with faculty to discover knowledge, to work on their research, and most of all, to discover their joy of science and pass that forward for generations to come. Education and research has been and will continue to be the best hope for keeping minds open, for discovering the joy and fostering the joy of science. So with that, I'll introduce the provost of NDSU, Dr. Margaret Fitzgerald. Hello. I have the privilege of telling you a little bit more about Dr. James Sukahara this morning. And as I understand, Nikki, his neighbor, called him Mr. Jim, which I learned um, this morning. And it's nice to see so many friends and neighbors uh, from the area here today. Um, as Dean Wallen said, Dr. Sukahara was born in Los Angeles, Colorado in 1918 and enrolled at the University of California, Berkeley during the 1930s, graduating with honors in 1939. Following the outbreak of World War II, he and his family were sent to an internment camp in Utah. He was 24 years old at the time. And perhaps the only bright spot of that experience was meeting and marrying the love of his life, May. And as a graduate student, he was allowed to leave the relocation camp to continue his studies at the University of Utah, where he was the first PhD recipient in organic chemistry in 1947. Dr. Sukahara had a very successful career as a faculty member, progressing from an instructor to a full professor at the University of Utah before moving into administration here at NDSU, where he held numerous positions. Dean of what is now called the College of Science and Mathematics, Dean of the Graduate School and Director of Research Administration, Interim Chair of the Department of Polymers and Coatings, Acting Vice President for Academic Affairs, Blue Key Doctor of Service, Professor Emeritus, and he also earned an Honorary Doctor of Science degree, or all the titles, as my kids would say. Throughout his career, Dr. Sukahara built a reputation as a research scientist and highly published scholar, popular classroom teacher and advisor, and consultant to the U.S. Department of Energy, Sun Oil Company, Exxon Oil Company, and the National Science Foundation, among other organizations. It's also noteworthy that he served the community in roles such as the Board of Directors and Presidency of Cass Clay United Way, and as a member of the U.S. delegation who met with USSR oil experts 
on geochemistry and fundamental properties of petroleum in various cities, including Moscow and Leningrad. He was a person who cared deeply about his campus, the community, and the world. Dr. Sukahara has been described as freely giving respect and praise, was always smiling, and he had a steadfast commitment to grace and understanding. I do remember his smile and how his whole face lit up when he smiled, which to me was an indication of the depth of joy that he had. And although I did not know him well, I do remember working with him on MSU's chapter of Phi Kappa Phi and how dedicated he was to Phi Kappa Phi. So in addition to telling you about Dr. Sukahara this morning, I also have the privilege of introducing University Distinguished Professor Dr. Neil Goodmastad. Dr. Goodmastad is a native of North Dakota he was born, raised, and educated in the state. He received his master's and PhD degrees in plant pathology from NDSU in 1978 and 1982, respectively. And he became a faculty member at NDSU in 1985 as an assistant professor of seed potato pathology. Dr. Goodness had rose through the academic ranks and was named one of the inaugural University Distinguished Professors in 2007. He was also named to the first fully endowed faculty chair position at NDSU in 2015, a position named in his honor. The Neil Goodmanston Endowed Chair of Potato Pathology was established by the contributions of 48 donors from 15 states and two Canadian provinces, a clear indication of the depth and importance of his potato research program. Dr. Goodmanstead is the only faculty member from NDSU to be named a fellow of the American Phytopathological Society. And although he retired from NDSU in 2020, he was named a 50 for 50 honoree, which recognizes the achievements of 50 individuals for their impact and importance to the North American potato industry during the past 50 years. He has had an amazing career. But what you may not know is that his career may never have happened if it wasn't for Dr. James Sukahara. One of my favorite authors, Dr. Seuss, said, to the world you may be one person, but to one person you may be the world. Dr. Sukahara was the world to Dr. Goodmanstead at one very important point in time. And I'm going to let him tell you the story. So please join me in welcoming University. Thank you, Margaret. One small correction to what Margaret said is I'm a university distinguished professor emeritus. I, am, I regard myself as a recovering academic. And you may think that's easy, but it's not to recover from being an academic for as long as I was. I want to thank Dr. Shani for inviting me to, to be here today. And, and it's a great honor. I hope you understand just how important Jim Sugara was to me. And I apologize for calling him Jim, but in 2008 I moved, my wife and I moved into a condo when our kids left, and I was, you know, we lived across the hall from Jim and May um, for a number of years, and that was a special experience for me. But I'm uh, very honored and humbled to be here uh, because he was extremely important to me, and as, as Margaret said, I really don't think that, that I would be here today, and I know I would not have the career that I had if it wasn't for James Udhar. Um, in order to, to, to be able to share that with you, I'm going to have to tell you a small story. And I know it's going to run too long, but that's not my fault. It's Dean's fault because he said, you're the keynote speaker. You don't have any time left. So here we go. So I, I was born uh, in North Dakota, and I lived and worked on a small family farm. My, my father 
was the oldest of nine children. My mother was the, I'm sorry, he was the youngest of nine children. My mother was the oldest of eight children. Um, I, like my brothers, all had to go to work on the farm on our eighth birthday. We woke up at 3.30 in the morning, not knowing we were gonna wake up at 3.30, well, my brothers probably did, but I didn't. And we had to go to work. I learned two things from my father during, during that time, because it was a small grain dairy farm. And I learned that I really didn't like being coated with manure or smelling like manure. Uh, and that I had to do something different than smelling like manure all the time. And number two, the value of hard work. My dad instilled in all of us the value of working hard to be successful. And I think that's the one thing that, that I've got going for me. So when I made the decision in high school that, that I wanted to go to college, it wasn't, extreme, it wasn't a very popular opinion among my parents, although my mother did grab the idea more quickly than, than my father. The reason is, is that among all of my cousins from the siblings that my parents had, not one individual among those 88 or 89 cousins went to a four-year school. They went to trade schools. A couple of them went to the Interstate Business College here in Fargo and got a five or six month degree in, in accounting, but no one went to a four-year school. So the idea of spending four years of not working was just absolutely foreign to them. But I made it, I went, and my mother had convinced me that, that the key to wealth and obsolete, at least financial security, was to become a high school teacher. Because they always wore nice clothes, and they always drove fairly nice cars, which we did not. And so I decided I was gonna become a high school science teacher. After a less than positive experience student teaching, I decided that I was gonna take the advisor, my James Lottie was my advisor, gonna take his advice and be able to teach in college and go to graduate school. I applied, and, and again, it wasn't, you think about it, this is 1974, 73, 74 winter. I decided I'm gonna to go to graduate school. <coughs> Al Gore hadn't invented the internet yet. <laughs> so getting online and trying to, to apply for school, you know, wasn't, wasn't the easiest thing. Plus, I had taken a class from my advisor, it was mycology, the study of fungi, and because he had gotten his degree, his PhD at the University of Minnesota, and mycology is taught in plant pathology, he covered a lot of fungi that attack plants. It had never occurred to me that plants could get sick too. I decided I was going to be a plant pathologist. Finding plant pathology departments around the land grant universities was, was really difficult. I applied to 13 or 14 of them. Uh, most uh, told me that I applied too late. Didn't send a check back for the application fee, but they did tell me that I'd applied too late. The exception was North Dakota State. And I got a letter from the dean, James Sugara, telling me that I'd been accepted and that I would be welcome for the fall quarter, the quarter system back then, of 1974. Later I got a, he told me I was gonna get a letter from the chair of the department uh, in more detail. I got that letter was to be on campus on August 1st, to matriculate, finish my matriculation, and get ready to start the fall quarter. So I arrived, and you're gonna wonder why I, I have such a vivid <laughs> memory of this. Because it started out really horrible, and it ended very, very sweet, obviously with Jim Sugar. So I get on campus, I meet with the chair of the department, uh, shows me where my desk is going to be, which was like putting yet another sardine into a can, into the room. Um, he gave me a tour of the actual floor that we were on, which was the third floor of Wolster Hall. We shared it with animal science, and when I went by the digestion lab of animal science, it reminded me way too much of what I had spent most of my life smelling. But I, you know, I was really excited about doing it about starting school, although I had anxiety about getting into a different discipline. He assigned another student who had gotten his bachelor's degree in plant pathology 
at NDSU and was starting graduate school that fall also to give me a tour of campus. All the, the sites, uh, go to the plant path greenhouses, go to the buildings where I would be taking some of my classes, etc. During that walk, he said, he said, now, what, where did you come from? So I told him, what did you get your degree in? I said, biology and chemistry. He says, you know, we all were under the impression that you had gotten your degrees here at NDSU, but I'm giving you a tour, so obviously that's not true. Where, where did you go to school? I said, I got my biology chemistry degrees at Dallas City State. He stopped, dead in his tracks. Valley City State, you're in trouble. You are not gonna make it. Nobody from Dickinson and Mayville and Valley City State, Bemidji, doesn't matter where you come from, small school, you have not had the education in order to go to graduate school here at North, North Dakota State. You are gonna have to bear down, and even if you do, because you're gonna be doing your research, it's highly unlikely you're gonna make it. He said, I'm, I'm sorry no one told you this, but that's reality. He was supposed to have me at the graduate school by 10 o'clock. We arrived shortly after nine. He had already written me off. So since I already had a lot of anxiety about going to graduate school at NDSU, I, I sat there, and even though it was a beautiful, cool morning, and seasonably cool as I remember it, I broke out into a sweat. And I was literally, I knew that I was in trouble because I could feel the sweat running down my back. <coughs> And I sat and sat and thought about what I'd just been told. And I, I realized that I was in over my head. That I needed to bail. I needed to get out now. And his administrative assistant gave me a glass of water. She could obviously see that I was struggling. And as I was getting ready to walk out and, and leave, her phone buzzed. And she said, Dr. Sugahara, we'll see you now. I said, um, tell him, tell him I, I, I can't do this. He said, Dr. Sugahara, we'll see you now. <laughs> so I went in, and as she let me in the door, he took one look at me and he said, uh, can we get a glass of water? <laughs> <laughs> and we sat down and, and he was uh, welcoming me. You know, to be honest, I don't remember a lot of what he was saying because I was trying to formulate the words to tell him that, that I was in over my head and I was leaving. And he said, is there something you want to say? And so I said it. I said, I'm, it's become apparent to me that I need to get out of here. I can't do this. He said, oh yes you can. Oh yes you can. He took out a little, he had gotten a file read my transcript, he said, well, you have excellent grades in both biology and chemistry. You've taken just a whole lot of other science that I would not have expected. You would have way more credits than you need for a bachelor's degree. He said, were well, you going to be a science teacher or something? <laughs> <laughs> I said, in fact, I think that's what I need to go back to. I really do. He said, no, we're not. He said, I'm here to help you. I'm here for you. Every, at the end of every quarter, he called me. Every quarter, asked me how the club, he knew how my grades were. He always said, hey, well, you got A's. I knew you could do that. How's your research going? Every quarter, spring quarter, he asked me to come over to his place, to his office again. And basically the message was, you don't need me anymore. You're doing just fine. And you know the rest is history, basically. But I was going to bail. I was, I was out of here. I, I, I knew I couldn't make. Jim told me differently. I owe everything to Jim Sugar. That's a lot. It's a lot. So today is an extremely special day for the Sugar family. It's an extremely special day for NDSU, and I'm here to tell you that, that I'm sure that I was not the only student in his time at Utah and his time here that he helped make them what they became. And for that, I am so happy that the name Sugahara 
is going to be among the icons of this institution. The, the, the Burghams, you know, the Stockbridges, the Wolsters, the Waldrons, the Lads. It's about time. It's long overdue, and it's finally here. So enjoy your day. Like I said, Dr. Sugihara, an extraordinary scholar, an extraordinary administrator, extraordinary teacher, but why his name being affiliated with this building is he was an extraordinary person is what really resonates with me. And I want to thank you all for braving the, I think it's minus 14 when I last looked at my phone. Uh, so a, a bright, brisk day in Fargo in January. Um, but at this point, we'll do the ceremonial cutting of the ribbon. Yeah. I'd like to have the speaker, uh, Dr. Sugihara's grandson, and uh, great grandkids are here to join us in doing that. And uh, we can get you on your way into the beautiful sunny day we have outside. <laughs> um, so, Stephanie, you've got the Hopkins of Water. And if our speakers and the Sugihara could come up, that'd be great. <laughs> Sir, you're woman. Should you choose to accept it? <laughs> here you go. Here you go. Sorry. Okay, and you're all armed, so on three we will all come up here, grab the ribbon, and on three we'll cut. One, two, three. <laughs>